changed, but we're good to go. Rid of that. So we're going to continue talking about limits today. Um, remember, we introduced the concept of a, of a limit yesterday. The limit as x goes to c of f of x equals L and sorry, I don't know why this has to be fighting me this way. I'm just trying to close this. It's not going to close. Oh well. We said the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals L means speaking a little informally, but the closer X gets to C, the closer F of X gets to L. And let me uh, let me make a few further comments. Um, the first comment we touched on yesterday, and I really want to drive home on this one. If we're taking a limit, we do not that If we're taking a limit, we do not let x be c. We're letting x get close to c, but x isn't equal to c. And the example I gave, I mean, I've never taken um, a relativity course, probably most of you haven't either, but this is sort of, I think, in the popular consciousness that things cannot accelerate to light speed. So if we're looking at the velocity of an object, we can ask what happens as the velocity gets close to light speed, but we can't ask what happens when the velocity equals light speed. A perhaps less obscure example is that every circle has a positive radius. A circle cannot have a radius of zero. So you can ask what happens to the area of a circle as the radius gets close to zero, but asking what the area of a circle whose radius is zero doesn't make any sense. The radius can get close to zero, but the radius can't equal zero. And then another brief comment, X can be either greater than or less than and this kind of breaks the circle example because a radius can't be negative. We'll come back to that in a later section, but we can approach C, I mean, just looking at this as a mathematical statement without any real world meaning attached to it. We can approach C from above or we can approach C from below. So,
recording. So you can look at, say, the limit as x approaches 2 of, let me just pull something out of my hat, 3x squared plus x minus 1. And we would like to be able to find such a limit. Um, so we're interested in being able to find limits. And at the moment, we don't really have any tools for that. Um, we could go to Desmos, perhaps, and take a look at this limit kind of numerically. Let's do that. Let me new share, go to Desmos, 3x squared plus x minus 1. And let's create a table of, we'll call this f of x, and if we do that, we can create a table of values on Desmos. Uh, and I pull this down. Doesn't no, doesn't seem so. So if we want to know what happens as x gets close to 2, we can certainly take a look and see if an answer appears. And it kind of looks like as x is approaching 2, this is rounding error. It's not literally 13, but it certainly looks as if as x is getting closer and closer to 2, f of x is approaching 13. And that's going back to something I said earlier about approaching to or approaching C from either direction. If we start above two and then shrink towards it, it looks once again as if F of X is approaching 13. So it would be it would be a reasonable to speculate that this limit is 13. But we don't at the moment have a way of formally saying that. A quick mathematical way of taking limits without um, messing around with tables and trying to numerically approximate stuff. We'll uh, fix that today and tomorrow. But let me first make an observation. I said very firmly that when we take a limit, we don't let x be the value that it's approaching. So we shouldn't let x be 2. Now, having said that, we think our limit is 13. And eagle-eyed students might have noticed when I was messing around with that table, 13 is what we get when we stick two into this function. So 
I've said that isn't true, or at least that that isn't always true. Maybe we should look at an example where the limit exists and it's different from what we get if we stick that C into the function. So continuing to just investigate limits with tables. Let's look at the limit as x approaches 3 of x squared minus x minus 6 divided by x minus 3. And let's make the immediate observation that we couldn't let x equal 3 even if we wanted to. If we stuck 3 in here, we would get a division by zero error. So if this limit exists, we certainly don't get it by sticking three into the function. Let's once again go to Desmos and numerically investigate this limit. And let's, let's see, clear that table off. Enter this in, x squared minus x minus 6 divided by x minus 3. We'll create a table, x and f of x. And let's let x get close to 3. We'll start at 2.9. 2.99, let's hurry that up a little. It certainly seems that as X is getting closer to three, the values in this table are getting closer to five. And this is true as well. If we let x be greater than 3 and then shrink towards it. So the answer to this question, huh, we're seeing some weird rounding error with this one. But the answer to the question, what happens as x gets closer and closer to 3, appears to be that f of x gets closer and closer to 5. And once again, x cannot equal 3. So we can't take this limit by just sticking 3 into the function. So there's, I mean, I'll put a question mark here because we've just numerically approximated this. We don't know that this is correct, but it certainly looks like the answer to this is fine. Five is five, and that's not gotten by letting x be a three. In fact, I'll make a border statement in the cases where we would care about a limit.
the function is almost never defined at C. So the example I had in the previous case is the rule, not the exception. And I mean, again, sort of looking at the examples I've talked about, um, if we're, if we're take, looking at the area of a circle as X shrinks to zero, as the radius shrinks to zero, I meant to say, why don't we just let the radius be zero? Well, because a circle can't have zero as a radius. If we're looking at an object whose velocity is approaching light speed, why don't we just let the object's velocity be light speed and see what happens? Well, it can't. Objects cannot accelerate to light speed. So in general, if we're looking at limits, this value f of c won't even be defined. Let's make an observation, an important or at least useful observation. Does anybody have any questions about what we've said so far in this school um, class period? So if that last example was a problem, then the answer that you'd get credit for would be five? Yeah, and we'll probably probably tomorrow, although who knows what we'll cover today, but probably tomorrow we'll also learn how to take that limit without messing around with tables. So the observation I was going to make is that it's perfectly possible for the limit as x approaches c of f of x not to exist. So it's perfectly possible to have a function where as x approaches c, f of x doesn't approach anything. And Probably the most immediately clear example of something like this would be if we use the table once again to investigate the limit as X approaches one of one divided by X minus one. We make the observation right away that if X equaled one, we'd get a division by zero error, but that isn't the problem really. I mean, here, if we let X be a three, we'd get a division by zero error, but the limit still existed. So just getting the division by zero error at one isn't necessarily causing a problem. We can get that error and still have a limit. But if we go back to Desmos and we numerically investigate this, once again, using a table, here's X, here's F of X, Let's let x get close to one and see what number f of x is approaching. And we'll quickly realize that f of x isn't 
approaching a number as x gets close to one. As x is getting close to one, f of x is just jumping down. It's going towards negative infinity. And the closer we get to one, the further down this graph gets. So as x approaches one, f of x is not approaching a number. It's just plummeting down. And that's true as well. If we approach one from the other direction, if we start above one and we approach it, f of x isn't approaching any, any, oh, go away. Why do you have to be like that? As we approach one, f of x isn't approaching any number. It's just now zooming up and getting bigger and bigger. So that's probably the easiest way that a function can fail to have a limit. And let me go back to whiteboard and let me state this as kind of a general thing that could happen. Case one. It, it might be that as x gets closer and closer to c, then instead of approaching some finite number, this function might blow up. It might run away to infinity or run away to negative infinity. And if that occurs, then this function does not have a, this limit as x approaches c of this function does not exist. Sorry for the kind of, I don't know if you this has been bothering you too, the kind of delay between my writing and the stuff appearing on the board. I think maybe the weather is messing around with our wireless a bit. So that's one case where a limit might not exist. Another classic example of a limit that doesn't exist would be the heavy side function. You don't have to memorize this, but we did mention this function before as an example of a piecewise defined function. So this heavy side function has a graph like this. And the limit, I don't know how to make Desmos do a piecewise defined function if Desmos even can do a piecewise defined function. 
So let's try to make this argument on the whiteboard. Let's create a table of values. And let's let x get closer and closer to zero. And let's see what happens. We'll start with 0 0.1. Now, 0 0.1 is positive. So we're in the second piece of H of X, and H of X is 1. And as we let x get closer to zero, well, these numbers are all positive, and h of x just keeps on being one. So our intuition just from this table would be that the limit might be one. As x is getting closer and closer to zero, h of x is just staying at one. <laughs> but going back to what I said near the beginning of class, x should be able to approach zero from either direction, from the positive side, or from the negative side. You remember in all of those examples on Desmos, we approached the limit from both sides and we saw that we got the same thing. Here, if we now approach zero from the left, h of x is zero now. We're in, we're in that piece of the piecewise defined function. And if we get closer and closer <coughs> to zero, well, as long as we're negative, this heavy side function keeps being zero. So what should we say? What happens as X approaches zero? Well, the heavy side function is either zero or one. It's not approaching a single number. And that's the other major way that a limit might fail to exist. And we see what happens graphically. There is this jump in the graph at zero where the limit does not exist. And let me state that. We're looking at this limit. And this limit will not exist if the graph jumps. at C. So if we have a function that's doing something like this, it's in the two pieces, and at C it jumps from one piece to another, then the limit won't exist at C. For our purposes, these are the two main reasons a limit wouldn't exist. 
And what I mean when I say for our purposes is that each of these more or less gets a textbook section dedicated to it. So we'll study this case when we get to continuity. And we'll study this case when we get to limits involving infinity. There is a third case, which we're never going to study in any sort of depth, but it's kind of interesting. I guess there's no harm in showing it. Wild oscillation. at C may stop the limit as X approaches C from existing. And what on earth is that supposed to mean? There's one kind of canonical example that always gets shown to students because it illustrates this possibility so well. And it's the limit as X approaches zero of the sign. of one divided by X. So let's take, go to Desmos. Where is my share hiding? There it is. Let's go to Desmos. And let's take a look at F of X equals the sine of one divided by X. And we're interested in what happens at zero. So let's zoom in a little. And what's happening is that in this interval, the sign is going between negative one and one infinitely often. And this isn't, I mean, this isn't defined at zero, but once again, the division by zero error isn't what's causing the limit to not exist. We've seen examples where the limit did exist, even though we had that error. What's causing this limit not to exist is this wild oscillation at the value that we're interested in. And if we created a table, uh, x versus f of x, and we let x get closer to zero, these values don't appear to be approaching anything. They're just kind of bouncing around from positive 0.5 to negative 0.5 to positive 0.8 to negative 0.3 to positive 0 0.03 to negative 0 0.3. So there isn't any pattern to these numbers. We're just 
going wildly but and sort of at random between negative one and one. So because these f of x values aren't approaching a number, the limit doesn't exist. And that's sort of the third classic way where a limit would fail to exist. The share back to the white. Does anybody have questions about the material that we've discussed so far? Then we have a bit of time left. Let's start to answer the following question. Can we find limits without messing around? with tables. That is to say, can we find limits as an algebraic process? And the answer to this question is a resounding sometimes. And I don't really want to emphasize limit finding tricks in this class because that's not really what Count to This is about. Count to this is about studying rates of change and net changes and things like that. Limits are a tool. We'll use them to define important objects in calculus, but we're not so interested in them as their own thing. So spending a lot of time learning to find limits that then don't show up later in the course is time that could be perhaps better spent on rates of change and net changes and applications and things that really matter to us. So I'm going to de-emphasize this material a little, but there are a fair number of kind of elementary facts you should know about to limits. Here's a fact. It's a pretty boring fact. You, I, you won't have your life changed by seeing this. But the limit as x approaches c of any constant function is just that constant value. It doesn't matter what c is. And this, I mean, if you give it just a little thought, should be pretty straightforward. Let's replace f of x here with a constant function. f of x equals 5. What happens as x is approaching 0? Well, f of x is just 5 forever. And that's reflected in the fact that 
that the limit as x approaches zero of the constant function phi equals five. And there's nothing special about zero. There is nothing special about five. The limit as x approaches two of negative three equals negative three. The limit of any constant is just the constant. So not the most exciting fact, but moving on. Fact two, the limit as x approaches c of x equals c. And once again, that I think that should be pretty clear once we've maybe seen an example. So my claim is that for example, the limit as x approaches 2 of x equals 2. Let's go to Desmos and let's ask ourselves if this statement makes sense. New share Desmos f of x equals x, we'll create a new table, here's x, here's f of x, was it two I was letting x go to? Yeah. So x and f of x are the same thing. So when you think of it that way, of course it's true that as x approaches to f of x approaches to uh, missing a decimal there, but of course it's true because x and f of x are exactly the same. So how could this approach to and this approach anything but so that is a pretty intuitive statement when you view it in light of this kind of table. Let's make one more statement. And this is good. I was never planning on finishing this section today. If the limit, let me do these as the same order they're in in my notes so that I can start where I left off tomorrow. If the limit as X approaches C, of f of x exists. Let's call it capital F. And the limit as x approaches c of g of x exists. Let's call it capital G. Then the limit as x approaches c of f of x plus or minus g of x is the sum or the difference of these limits. So doing a quick 
example, because we're running short on time, the limit as x approaches 2 of x minus 7. Well, we know how to find the limit of x. That was the second rule we put on the board. And we know how to find the limit of 7. That was the first rule we put on the board. X is approaching 2. And 7 is approaching 7. And X minus 7 is therefore approaching 2 minus 7. So if we have addition and subtraction and we want a limit, we can just find the individual limits and then add or subtract them. And we'll pick right up with rule four in class tomorrow. I will see you then. Hopefully with, less, uh, with fewer technical frustrations.